All right, we're going to pick up our discussion over the skeletal muscle physiology. Last time we reviewed the excitation contraction uh, coupling event, and then we introduced the cross bridge cycle after understanding the, um, the structure of the sarcomere, the structure of the thin filament, as well as the thick filament. So I just want to go back and quickly review the cross bridge cycle. As we've been doing, we just look at it the one time before we go back and wrap up skeletal muscle uh, physiology. So to recall for you, the cross-bridge cycle is the events that are involved in contraction. We know that contraction will initiate only once cytosolic calcium is, is available from the, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Where does calcium bind? In the skeletal muscle. Component of the, of the thin filament pulls back, so we'll pop her out, pulls back our Copamycin to expose the binding site on actin. At that point, the thin and thick filaments can bind uh, if ATP has already been bound to. Where does ATP bind? Where does the ATP bind in this scenario? On the myosin on the head. Okay, so not like the myosin bind to ATP, it also binds. Uh, the actin molecule. However, just because they're binding doesn't mean that there's necessarily any contraction. And so we have to power the, the, the contraction or what's referred to as the power stroke. And we know that there's an ordered uh, series of events that take place in that after the thin and thick element binds, ATP can be squeezed at that, my, that um, ATP that sitting on the myosin head. It's split, and then what happens is the inorganic starch phosphate is referred to as that kind of activates this uh, this power stroke. So inorganic phosphate is first cleaved off, and then right behind it, what is cleaved off? The ADP will come off, and so as the ADP uh, is removed, you'll have what's referred to as the power stroke, which means a myosin head will ratchet the thin filament towards which line of the sarcomere would these be moving? Towards the stem line, towards the middle. So we're bringing our sarcomere or our new line closer towards uh, the M line. So the ADP is removed. Yet, even though ADP is removed, the thin and thick filament are still what? They're still bound to one another. So how do we cause this detachment? A new molecule of ATP has to bind to the myosin head to physically cause the detachment. If calcium is still available, that ATP can split and right, continue to rebind and then continue the cycle. A couple of things to note about this cross bridge cycle is that we're looking at a tiny, very microscopic section between the thin and the thick filament. This is not an entire thin filament. This is not an entire thick filament. It is not an entire sarcomere. Let's understand how the whole sarcomere and the whole myofibril work. Let's look at the interaction between one myosin cross bridge and a single thin filament. If you recall, the, if you recall, the thick filament would have right, multiple thousands of these myosin cross bridges right, three decades long. There may be some actin left unattached, so it's not necessarily a 100% myosin to actin binding. Um, quantitatively, okay, so what we're going to study where we're headed in just a minute is depends on the status of the muscle. If it's in its optimal length, there will be one, basically 100% overlapping. If the muscle stretched, a minimal amount of the thin filaments are being activated by the myosin cross, cross bridges. And the same thing if it's too short, everything's jumbled up and so you can't have maximal. So to better answer that question, it depends on how the whole muscle organ is stretched or not. That's a good question. Um, furthermore, on that topic where you're going is, if you recall, our myosin cross bridges are actually in pairs. And so one head may be attached while the other is 
impact is that I just had a school at law and uh, work in opposite of one another so that we can alternatively whack it and, and bring that mindset, excuse me, bring the action more towards in line. Good question. Additional questions or clarifications? Uh, last time we went on and uh, actually, you know what, I have a video. Let me just show that real quick. It might help you visualize what's going on. Okay. So we introduced the Crossbridge cycle in the series of events. And then last time we said, well, that's within a tiny star to here. We need to put together well, what's happening in Colossus in the entire organ. Uh, and even before we understand how the organ works, we look at a cell, an entire cell. So that's what we looked at was an individual muscle fiber, the event. What we studied is when a muscle cell gets excited by the presence of acetylcholine, it's not going to immediately contract, right? Which makes sense. It's taken us two weeks to lead up here uh, to contraction uh, that we talked about last Thursday. What is that period of muscle excitation where there's the, pre the stimulus is present but there's no contraction? What do we label that as? The, la the latent period, the latent period uh, is that period of time where there's a stimulus present, but no physical contraction. So we've got to excite the cell, excite the SR, release calcium, go through the Crossbridge cycle. Then the cell can generate tension. What is that tension phase called? Contraction. Just contraction. Okay, so what we've been wanting to talk about for two weeks, right? The contraction happens following the latent period. Yes. The latent period is that phase of time. Uh, really, you could just simply say during excitation, contraction, coupling. The latent period is during that excitation, contraction, coupling events. Following that, then the cell can contract, generate force, and then it will relax. And a thing that we noted last time is that the relaxation, the muscle's not going to just plummet from a maximal to a minimal amount of force. It's going to kind of decline slowly so that you don't drop or something or fall or right, whatever the case may be. It's going to be more of a progressive decline when compared to the actual contraction. Again, these are events of what's called a, a muscle twitch that happens in a single cell. I may have mentioned uh, on Thursday that single muscle twitch isn't how a muscle organ actually contracts. Okay? But to understand how the organ contracts, we've got to look at a single cell. Because that's when you're putting the, the muscle twitches. Furthermore, if we look at within an organ, uh, as we mentioned, a single twitch occurs within a skeletal muscle cell or fiber However, our cells are, um, you know, organs are made up of multiple cells. So we really want to see how twitches can be summed together. What does that mean if we sum twitches? Sum them together. We add them together. And so if you sum them together, what are you really adding together? All the cells twitching and specifically their, the what? Uh, that it, you're not. Not technically the individual cells, their active essentials aren't summing together. What are we summing together? The tension, the force, the mechanical force generated by the muscle cells. So your skeletal muscle cells can sum their force to increase the output. So to, to help put this image together, you have uh, on the y-axis the tension, the force in grams, uh, over time in milliseconds. The arrows are illustrating uh, a particular stimulus, so a release of acetylcholine. In the first scenario, we have just a single stimulus, and so a single contraction or relaxation. What did we label that as? That is a single what? It's just a single twitch. There's no summation. One stimulus, one twitch. Okay. However, if the stimuli becomes more frequent, a cell may contract and relax, receive a new stimulus, and do what again? Contract. And what happens to 
the fourth generation. It increases. In the same city, after the second contraction and relaxation, doesn't fully go back to rest. And then a new stimulus and a, another contraction. So they're added together. This is a type of summation of muscle twitches. You'll see this, obviously, when there's frequent stimuli or maybe just a sustained stimulus. Right? So this is how you can hold something. Right? It can ask you to hold your pencil out. Have you heard of that before? You've probably heard of it in the form of the disease, the result of the their microbes. You may know that it's the um, bacteria called something. Clostridium tetani. Very good. Okay, so Clostridium tetani infection does cause a disease tetanus, but the word tetanus can also be used to describe just normal muscle physiology. What do you think happens during tetanus? The muscle tightens up, and if we look at two types, types of tetani, you may see a little bit of relaxation, but the average of the four is generated with constant. But you don't see any further increase in force generated. Okay. This first scenario, labeled as three, is what's considered to be incomplete tetanus, where there are some visible phases of relaxation. Uh, we're noting that the average force generated is consistent. It's not increasing with the repeated stimuli. There may be scenarios where a stimulus is so frequent that tetanus occurs and there is no visible relaxation. And then there's just a constant plateau phase. This type of tetanus is called a complete or fused tetanus. This isn't something that you would want to normally do uh, or undergo or experience to kind of do something or breathe or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but certainly our skeletal muscles can, uh, under extreme conditions, undergo complete tetanus. It's completely fused up. No more maximal force. What's going to happen to a cell undergoing complete or fused tetanus? after, say, a minute or two. Or may not necessarily die quite yet. It's going to fatigue. It's going to fail. It's not going to be able to generate force uh, until it kind of resets all its nutrients and, and it settles. What would cause that? Uh, in, a, in a lab setting, someone just shocking the heck out of a, of a muscle cell, for example. Um, so it's not something that you would normally exhibit. It's a normal movement. But you could sustain a contraction like uh, pick up some water buckets and just stand there. Right? You could have an average plateau tetanus contraction. But the same thing, your skeletal muscles are going to, they're going to eventually fatigue out and uh, fully relax. You won't be able to do that. Even though it's not as hard, we're going to learn that your skeletal muscles uh, take a lot of ATP and they burn through them pretty quickly. The next uh, image is illustrating the question about what's the proportion of overlap between uh, the actin and the myosin? Is it 100% or is it not? And really, it just depends on the status of the length of the muscle and of the muscle organ. Uh, so you can do a simple activity again. So let's just take your, your arm and just kind of hang them by your side. Uh, you can take your dominant hand and just place it on your bicep or triceps, whatever you want. It might be easier just to uh, put on your, your biceps. And you can just notice overall just length and status of the muscle. So if your, your muscle cells are there, your muscle organ is there, you can, you can just show it, right? And it's not, it's not generating a bunch of tension, but there is, and you could measure some tension being generated in there. Okay? But it's not maximum. You could also stretch out, excuse me, um, at this state, this is called the resting length. And you can have your arm just kind of hanging, that's the resting length. 
You can stretch your arms, so if you want to at, the, at your chair, maybe pull up, or however you want to, lean back, whatever. You can notice the, the muscle organ can be stretched. Okay, so it's static. And you can feel a bit more tension. You can actually augment by that stretching your neck. Furthermore, you can shorten your muscle. And then you can even shorten it even more. And so there's a lot of states that your muscle could be short, really short, um, partially contracted, relaxed, or even stretched. Okay. So depending on the status of the muscle wound is going to dictate the overlapping uh, of the sins that show up in this darker mirror. Furthermore, at either state, okay, fully stretched, relaxed, contracted, or shortened, and then the shorter that will go, the amount of force is very real. Okay, so you can't generate the same amount of force in your muscle organ if your muscle is stretched versus if it's relaxed versus if it's contracted or completely not shortened. Okay. The amount of force is variable, and that's what this is um, illustrating here. We're looking at, on the x-axis, the length of the muscle organ, so a percentage of the resting length, so it's a full rest or contraction or extension, plotted over the amount of tension that that particular muscle organ will generate. And so the maximal amount of tension is just a little bit, uh, just like a little bit longer right, than the resting length. Uh, and whatever organ, I don't know what muscle organ they're pulling up, but uh, somewhere between like, a little bit longer than the stretch, um, the rested and the stretch. And if you look at the, the areas at the top, the overlap, the thin film, which is showing the blue, the thick film is in the, in the orangey bar. And this is kind of that ideal overlapping. When there is a, um, a maximal overlapping between the symptoms of the stillness, that's when you can max out the tension generated. If the muscle is too short, okay, so it's really, really short, the thin filaments may jumble uh, over in the ape zone. And so even though they're present, they're not overlapping. So you're just kind of wasting space, if you will. And so you're not able to generate as much tension in the super short state. Same thing with the super extended state as well. The thin filaments, instead of jumbling in the, in the middle, they're just overlapping the, the ends of the A band, and so the amount of tension is going to be present. What questions does this image bring about as far as the muscle organ tension generated in the relationship with length? The next couple of um, points that we're going to discuss tie right back into what we studied in Chapter 11, utilizing a motor unit. So before we look at um, the motor units, let's just define them. How did we define a motor unit? A nerve, what kind of nerve? A somatic nerve. And all of the muscle cells, plural, it's innervated. It's an X number, however many muscle cells it controls. So again, a motor unit is one somatic nerve and the number of delta muscle cells which it controls. We reviewed or introduced in chapter 11 that not all motor units are the same size, meaning that some motor units have more muscle cells while others have fewer muscle cells. What types of movements can be made by larger motor units? What types of movements can be made with larger motor units? Can we... Well, we're definitely in the skeletal muscle system, so uh, what's... Okay, so like uh, say the abdomen would have larger motor units. What about smaller motor units? Like the hands? The hands, what else? More fine movements. The smaller motor units are going to give you more fine, precise, less powerful, but more precise movements, like as controlling your hands and your fingers. So by contrast, larger motor units must control what type of movement? We call it gross or large, big, powerful movements. 
in comparison to small ones. So, <clears throat> as, a, as an adjustment since we're not reading it, since we're in there and selling all the natural Yeah, it's a somatic. The definition we came up with uh, for, the, for the motor unit is a somatic nerve and the number of cells and muscle cells. Furthermore, within a muscle organ, you're going to have multiple motor units in it. Okay? So a muscle organ is not going to have just one motor unit. You don't have just one nerve controlling, say, your biceps or quadriceps or whatever. There's going to be multiple nerves or multiple motor units controlling it. And um, figure 12 and 2 uh, here to visualize uh, that the more muscle cells there are in a motor unit, the amount of force can increase. Furthermore, if we need to do a bigger movement, what can we do with our motor unit? Use more of them. If you use more motor units, you can sum their effect together and increase the force generated. So just walking in the room, I would use fewer motor units than if I were walking in the room with a 100 pound sack on my back, right? So I would need more motor, I could still do it, but I'm just gonna need more motor units because I need to generate not only enough tension to move my body, but also the load in my back. And so we, the addition of these motor units is called recruitment. If you need more, you recruit more. This actually ties right back into uh, chapter nine as well. Your body plans voluntary movement. So what part of our nervous system makes these planned recruitment and motor units? The frontal lobe. Cells in the frontal lobe will help plan this. And as we talk with the cerebellum, which is in the brain stem, descending nerves, or the somatic nerves, all that ties right back uh, in the gear. So if you want to move something, pick up something, do something, your brain, your central nervous system is going to predict the number of motor units that it needs. Okay? So let's give, a, let's give an example of an extreme to appreciate how often and precise the brain actually is. Okay? So let's think about a uh, player, I can, he has a, a satchel uh, on the floor, it's brown. Uh, it looks, it looks pretty heavy. Okay, um, so if I wanted to pick it up, my brain would say, "Oh, that looks pretty heavy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my hands and my arms. I'm gonna generate so X number of force, say five, ten pounds of force." Okay. But in actual actuality, let's say it's completely empty. There's nothing in there except for the bag and a pencil. So that would probably weigh ten pounds. If I gonna weigh or you know, however many, so, so maybe half as much. When I go to pick it up, my body is generating, activating enough muscle cells to lift 10 pounds of weight. What happens when I go to pick it up? <laughs> you know, throw it across the room, like uh, Supergirl, right? I'm gonna pick it up and throw it across uh, the room because my body was looking at some, my brain was evaluating something that was very heavy and in actuality it was very light. Does that ever happen to you? Or the opposite, where you're like, see, something's empty and it's actually full and you have to go back and kind of regroup. So, yeah. I was going to say, that kind of right after my mind with that, you know, when you're in gear and you're supposed to go a certain thing, it tightens it up and goes against the wall and then it's bad and it's just uh, not, not, not directly in the motor unit for recruitment. That's actually just due to the fatigue and activation of the skeletal muscles. Um, this is just, this is really more of an experience learning and experiencing the world and so as you grow and you lift things and you move things your body just learns and it begins to predict and ties back into perception and etc and so uh, you can look at something and you're you don't even have to think about it if you want to just pick it up you pick it up like whoa that's heavy you can only think of extreme scenarios but if you think about everything you do putting on a shirt picking up the pins like you would do your body is actively your brain is picking out the number of motor units. You don't over you know under recruit uh, the actual thing. So if we turn our attention then to figure 1219, uh, this is just reiterating that um, not all motor units are the same size. We have motor unit XYZ. Uh, we know that 
our larger motor units give us more powerful movement, uh, and then our smaller motor units give us more fine but less powerful uh, movement. And furthermore, we can sum, add together the, the force spin over by the motor unit. If you use x, y, and z, you're not going to max out at, the, at what just z alone, motor unit z alone. You could add the force of the circle is x to the force of y. So you would add all those together and try to see something much heavier than if you're trying to get with this motor unit x. You know, brain, just try to, try to think of the fact that that would just go back. Fortunately, right? You waste a lot of time thinking about moving and walking and sitting and etc. Breathing. What questions do the uh, does this talk about motor units uh, bring about? Well, that's a great question. The question is, if you do a repetitive movement, would you use the exact same motor unit over and over? And the question, the answer is no, until you start to fatigue the muscle, and you might have to start calling it back in. So what happens is, when you do a repetitive movement, like just walking back and forth, doesn't take a lot of effort. It certainly doesn't require all those skeletal muscles uh, in my legs and back to move, right? However, if I kept doing it on a treadmill, say for like an hour. What happens is you're with each step you're gonna say you use motor unit X. In the next step, you're gonna use motor unit Y. And then maybe the next step, motor unit O or whatever. Okay. What happens is that gives those muscles a chance to relax and recoup, put their energetics and oxygen back to step one. And so to answer your question, they alternate. Unless the workload becomes so much, and then you might need to bring in the two to five units. If you kept using the same motor unit over and over, you wouldn't be able to do something repetitive try more than like two minutes maximum. But are you still using, like I understand that you're not using X from time to time, but aren't there multiple X's? Well, let's just use like X2. Sure. Okay. So this is just using, instead, instead of saying X, one, two, three, four, it's just using or you can say there's an O that may have three muscles in it as well. Do they add on top of each other? Like if you pick up something heavy, are you using saying it's XA one or XA? Yes. Uh, so possibly. Um, and if that becomes too forceful or repetitive, then maybe right, so maybe you could sum X and Y together. And if it becomes repetitive or not strong enough, then you might add Z or explicitly just use Z. And again, uh, your motor units are called X, Y, Z. That's just the uh, way to illustrate. So we have these thousands of different types of motor units okay. in different spots. Does that mean that you can't feel pick up something very, very heavy and not be tolerable? Right. So if you have to use all the motor units in a given muscle cell, yeah, there's going to be a limit to even if you can even do the work, and then two, how long you can do the work. Right, so um, you're gonna reach the maximal force that that organ will generate. So if my eyes, I have skeletal muscles in there to control you know, uh, the dilation, etc. So those muscles can generate tension, but they can't generate the same amount of tension as say the muscles in my bicep. Okay, so I can max out all the motor units controlling the muscles in my eye, and I would never even come near to the workload in my bicep. Um, so that actually is going to feed us into the next <laughs> next discussion about why is this so variable. So let's just go there. Um, so the reason that there's so much variability is that not all more muscle organs are the same size. Okay, so we go to the eye leg type scenario, right? Okay, so not all muscle organs are the same size. Clearly, those organs which are larger are going to be able to generate much more force than those organs which are smaller. So that's one reason uh, there's some variability in the tension generated. Furthermore, we just talked about the motor units. Not all motor units are the same size. 
And not all motor units are recruited. They said it's variable depending on like it depends upon if you're doing a repeated action or uh, lifting something heavy or whatever the case may be. So the motor units and just the size of the muscle organ dictate our variability. Furthermore, within the muscle organ, you've got to look at not only just the motor units, but turn your attention to the muscle cells, the muscle fibers. The question is, sure the, sure the nerve is exciting them, but is the muscle cell even responding? Does it have the nicotinic receptors or uh, has it been damaged? We talked about how stealth muscles can't be uh, repaired if they're like, terribly damaged. Uh, so again, looking into that, if the muscle cell is even contracting itself. And then within the muscle fibers, the amount of tension. Because uh, we mentioned that stealth muscle cells, the amount of biochemicals in them depend on the use. So the more often a muscle cell is used, the more amount of fibrils it'll have. And the more amount of fibrils it has, the more less tension it can generate. But if you have your arm in a sling for a week, your mild fibril count is going to go down, and the tension is going to also decline. So just the intracellular structure within muscle cells is variable as well. That's why we get so much back for why somebody can lift something heavy and someone else can't. Or maybe you used to could lift something heavy and you can't when you're on stick. Um, is there kind of like a baseline number of motor units they always have, even if they don't really atrophy in a specific case, or is there a uh, You should not lose your motor unit. But what I mean is, hopefully it's not having dip nerve damage, because the, the motor unit is the nerve in the muscle cell. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what that's depending upon how you grow and develop as a fetus and then several little baby. Mm -hmm. So that number of nerve to muscle cell is constant. It shouldn't change at all. Um, if uh, you do have some damage, like I said, an accident or like a good example like rattlesnake bite or whatever, mm -hmm. then that's clearly going to take down the muscle cell and affect that. That's going to be a persistent problem no matter what you do throughout your life. Does that answer your question at all or do you want to rephrase it so I can make sure you answer it? Yeah, so when your muscles begin to atrophy, um, the myofibrils, it takes energy to keep them maintained. So if you're not using them, then you keep the cell mechanics within uh, set point. And so there's no reason to maintain the, all the ATP and those myosin phosphorus if they're not being utilized. And so um, they can be degraded, put into the bloodstream, and used for energy for maintaining something else. However, if the muscle does atrophy, you can begin to exercise and then tell that cell, those cells, to build more myofibrils. It is re it depends on if it's like a disuse atrophy, sure it can be re uh, reversible. If it's something like a toxic event or like a, I don't know why I'm thinking about rattlesnake girl on my mind. <laughs> like, uh, so um, nerve damage uh, would cause disuse atrophy, but if it's completely damaged, the muscle cell won't ever respond, so that would not be reversible. But if it's just because you have a cast on, that could be reversible. So it depends on where the disease is. Mm -hmm. And what happens with physical trauma? Like if you just like fell on something really hard and like hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you fall and you hurt yourself, uh, depends again, the same, depends on the degree of the damage. If it's enough that the cell actually dies, it's not replaceable. Uh, but if it uh, hurt for a long period of time and eventually it repairs, it can regain uh, its function. Mm -hmm. Depends on intensity. And then if someone moves, basically, you got to keep moving, exercising. So you can't have an accident and then stay mobilized with care forever and expect the muscle just to heal from it. Mm -hmm. That's where physical therapy would come into play. And that's why we, one of the reasons, not certainly the only reason, but after surgery or something, we need to lay around all day learning how to get up, get moving, primarily for uh, cardiovascular uh, health more than anything, but moving just keeps these muscles connected. So it just doesn't take very long. I don't know the time, but it's pretty quick how quickly a muscle atrophies, which makes, if you've ever exercised, 
and then you notice it takes you forever to get the bowl fit you want, then you take a, a week off and you're like, what's going on with all that? I'm just going to week off and back to where I started. So it doesn't take very long. Very good. Good question. Additional questions? So not all skeletal muscles generate the same amount of force uh, for some of the reasons which we just discussed. Furthermore, um, skeletal muscles do require energy. So this is going to tie us back to good old chapter of three uh, as far as where the uh, source of ATP. Uh, skeletal muscles need a bunch of ATP. And so therefore, they're going to rely upon our familiar glycolysis and aerobic respiration, which are the R2 right channels. Okay, so we know that uh, glycolysis can produce two net ATP molecules, which could phosphorylate a single, each could phosphorylate a myosin head. And that would be the power source. However, we know that under ideal conditions, the ascorbic acid will be transported to mitochondria and carry out aerobic respiration to produce uh, 30 some odd more molecules of ATP. So that's what we would hope for. However, we studied that it takes a while for aerobic respiration to actually produce that high amount of ATP. And our skeletal muscles have to contract fast and hard. If you think about right, why you use a skeletal muscle, you may need to physically just get out of harm's way. Your fight or flight mechanism kicks in, you get a reflex or whatever. It's one of our faster types of, of action. And so glycolysis isn't going to be fast enough to power some type of quick movement. And so we have a third source of ATP available to our skeletal muscles, and it's called creatine phosphate. And it's abbreviated PP uh, in this first column. Of this image that we have in the body here. So the PP is creatine phosphate. Uh, it has a single phosphate on it, so it can do what to ADP? It can phosphorylate. Do you know what type? Very good. Substrate level phosphorylate ADP to form how much ATP? One moly little molecule of ATP. Again, this is even less than glycolysis. But it's very, very what? Fast. And so if you quickly stand up, you're gonna you're changing from your resting to your movement state, you're gonna need a quick source of ATP to power those extra contractions. And so your muscles have creatine phosphate. So it produces a single molecule of ATP. If your exercise continues, so let's say now you stand up, but then you begin to walk out of the room, what can we start to use more of? Glycolysis. And then if you continue to exercise, what could you rely more upon? The Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Not very phosphorylated. What I want you to understand though is these, these glycolysis, the electron transport chain, they don't just turn off and on. I mean, so when you're sitting here, aerobic respiration is not, not happening. Glycolysis is not, not happening, right? They're happening, hopefully, as long as you're, you're healthy. So they're still running, but it's operating, if you will. Uh, but if you change your status, you need that extra energy to get you through some type of physical movement, you're going to have to call in now uh, creatine phosphate, and your body will make adjustments. So uh, what's new to us is creatine phosphate uh, is the source of immediate ATP uh, when we do some type of, of motion. Uh, if I could turn your attention to panel two, we're looking at glycolysis. We also are aware that if oxygen levels deplete, ascorbic uh, acid is converted over to lactic acid in your skeletal muscle. Uh, and so your body is going to have to uh, deal with that. We'll come to that in just a moment. So ideally, we would hope that there's oxygen readily available all the time so we don't ferment uh, and form lactic acid. And so what we can do is look at uh, the proportion of uh, these pathways used for different types of exercise. The first type of exercise that we can look at is just referred to as light exercise or maybe uh, we can even call it aerobic exercise, so where you're just moving, walking, nothing, nothing intense. You're not like weightlifting in the gym or something like that. You're just moving, maybe your heart rate is up, and etc. This is showing the proportion of uh, 
the different energy sources, whether it be creatine phosphate, glycolysis, or oxidative phosphorylation, they're each plotted. Uh, the proportion uh, of the source over time in minutes. And so if we're doing some light exercise, so if you're walking on the treadmill, okay, so you're just walking on a treadmill or walking through the tent with golf, that's considered to be light exercise. Our first source, we said is when we start the exercise, comes from where? Creatine phosphate. Okay, or pho you call it creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. But I want you to turn your attention to, just because the bulk of our ATP comes from creatine phosphate, is that our only source of ATP? No. Hopefully aerobic respiration is still prevailing, and glycolysis is obviously going to power right, aerobic respiration. How long is this going to last? Really? Not very long. Less than a minute. Okay, you're going to see. Does it stop completely? It's going to stop completely until replenished. Okay, so we're going to talk about how we can replenish that. So during the exercise, your creatine phosphate levels are relatively low or absent until you stop the exercise. And so where we're headed, there's a thing called oxygen debt. As you pay that oxygen debt, then you can reset your creatine. But you wouldn't expect to run for four minutes, take a minute off, and then have more creatine phosphate. You're going to have to rely more on still aerobic respiration or maybe even glycolysis. So that's why like I don't run, so I don't have a physical. <laughs> It's just all hard for me. Uh, so uh, <laughs> why don't do it? Uh, I don't know, is there any runners in here? Um, <coughs> have you ever experienced that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I feel like that's a while because I've been up there and I just eat it and I'm like, what am I doing? I haven't done that before. Yeah, like, exactly. it just means that it's not happening. So, what yeah. about how when you first start, like when you know it's like that, like you're the best part? So after the first minute, I don't yeah. feel after the first minute. I'm like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> and then mentally it's like your aerobic respiration should supply you adequate amounts of ATP from your exercise. But as noted by Claire, is it depends on how often you do right that exercise, right? What your body has become accustomed to and adapted to. But all tying in your nutrient levels, your oxygen levels, and etc. So why about how long into your so how long is your total exercise if you're running? When you experience this minute. Yeah. yeah, personally. When when you experience that that it doesn't feel like start really easy and after a few seconds, probably like about a minute. Okay. It gets difficult and then like my body gets used to it and okay. then it's tired and then like Okay, so it, you may be able to tangibly just Acknowledge when your nutrient levels or ATP levels are depleted, making that transition. Okay, it may be. I was thinking it was like more. I think I was thinking you were more like ten minutes in the exercise or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which is why. Okay. Uh, furthermore, when you just start doing exercise, you've got to cut your blood, oxygen. Okay, it always takes like a few seconds to make this transition. But, but maybe. I can't definitively answer that. So when we do uh, an exercise, uh, we'll pick up that next minute or so of exercise with which process? Glycolysis. And then if oxygen delivery is adequate, then we can power off increase the amount of oxidative phosphorylation, the Krebs cycle in your lifetime comes to play. And as long as the oxygen levels are good, okay, blood circulation, et cetera, respiration is good, you should be able to keep going. Right, until you just fatigue the muscle, run out of stores or whatever the case may be. So that's what happens during light exercise. And this is why you sometimes refer to it as aerobics. When you go to your aerobics class, you're trying to promote, really, what process? Not glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation. But nobody wants to go to oxidative phosphorylation for 30 minutes. That sounds unfun. So we'll call it aerobics class. Okay. If your exercise in increases, though, the intensity of the exercise, so think about like weightlifting. Okay, so you're really pushing 
yourself. So not only just exer easing yourself the muscle, but you're shortening or generating a lot of force. Your skeletal muscle organs are shortening. And what's happening, what's happening inside of your skeletal muscle organ when you're lifting weights? You may be just, if you're really pushing it, you may be breaking down those myofibrils and they promote it later. They're a sort of process. Rebuilding. Very good. What else is happening before we do any damage? The sarcomas are shortening. The whole organ is shortening. Generating a lot of tension. What is traveling through your muscle organ? Conditions. Anatomically, what is traveling through your muscles? By way of our blood, which is carried in your blood vessels. Okay, so what's happening to your blood vessels when you're in a constriction? They're constricting. They're squeezing. So, honestly, during a period of time when you need more blood flow, your blood flow actually decreases. So during intense exercise, what do you think is going to prevail? Anaerobic. Anaerobic glycolysis. Your aerobic respiration will plummet, and you're going to rely more upon the glycolysis. Is that why your blood sugar is going to go up when you're trying to do these things? Uh, yes, and because we're using it during glycolysis, but you would still use it for to power oxidative phosphorylation. Um, it may be just the sheer volume of cells being activated when you're doing something uh, intense. But um, when you uh, exercise, so after you eat, right? So if you eat a, a meal, it's encouraged that you actually um, exercise. So for go for a walk or something after dinner, not to promote glycolysis, but just to get the, the nutrients from the blood into your tissue. And then uh, if you do continue to exercise, sure, you could could catabolize, break them down and use them, or store them in your cells, or get them out of the blood and store them into your cells. And so it's, it's more of a mechanism of um, insulin telling your sugar to, to go into your cells, basically, mobilizing it. Uh, if, we look at, if we look at the plot, uh, glycolysis is going to prevail during that intense exercise. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation is going to be declined. It may actually turn off. If the exercise is not off, off, but even less than the uh, if the oxygen delivery is so low and that we can't get high enough oxygen to separate us. And I just have a question about the, the plot. If you if you took you after you in an exercise after you eat, if you've already exercised and your blood is pumping, does it do the same thing if you eat after then? Because how are you within thirty minutes of exercising your blood oxygen back in? Yeah, um, that those, that's if you're exercising. Okay. Uh, if you are, if you regularly exercise. For the average person who doesn't regularly exercise, who takes a meal and goes straight to the couch, okay. uh, the preferred mechanism, the preferred thing is to not go straight to the couch to get up and move. When you do that, the nutrients go to your muscles and not where. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So it just changes where that is nutrient to go to power that muscle activity and movement. <laughs> yeah, so it all depends on so if you exercise regularly or so. If you rec rec uh, exercise regularly, you're probably, you don't, probably don't have a nutrient reserve. And so it is important after a meal to put everything back in check, right? Otherwise, you start breaking down things like nerve cells or whatever to power you through. So it's good. But if you don't regularly exercise, just moving after a meal, it changes where the nutrients are used to being used. So it depends on what a person does, what kind of health they're in. And so we had a question about, well, well then what happens to the creatine phosphate? How can we get it back? And we mentioned this thing called the oxygen death. And it's that period of time after an exercise where you, um, after you stop the exercise and the respiratory rate is elevated. So maybe if you've exercised and you notice after you stop the exercise, your respiratory rate is maybe even faster than it was when you're in the middle of the exercise. Have you ever experienced that? 
as you go for a run, and when you stop and the, the panting may be there. Okay, so for another minute or two, uh, your oxygen uh, intake increases, and that ox the extra oxygen that you take in is leading what's called your oxygen death. And what's happening is you've got to put all your oxygen levels back to set point in the body. Your what? What is this abbreviation? Lactic acid, very good. Have to be reconverted back to lactic acid. So if we ferment it, we got to get rid of that lactic acid. That takes um, extra energy. You get any stores of glycogen mobilized from the liver or even in the skeletal muscles. Those have to be brought back to set point. So that takes extra energy. Uh, ATP has to be resynthesized. Reaching phosphate has to be resynthesized. That takes like a good minute or two, really, to kind of get the ball rolling, get in those shaking states back. So again, this is referred to as your oxygen death. That extra oxygen you take in after the exercise, bring it in back to the, uh, the set point. Okay. I want to turn your attention to now figures 1229 and 1230. I'm not going to, your textbook differentiates these different afferent nerves. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to go through and differentiate them. I do want you to just be aware. Chapter 10. Proprioception. We have sensory nerves in our skeletal muscle organ that monitor the status of the muscle for maintenance of balance and this protective mechanism. They are there to monitor the stretching, the contracting, the, uh, whatever of the skeletal muscle organ itself. And those sensory nerves are shown here in the blue. Our muscle organ, and just like everything else, is going to have a sensory uh, nerve in it. If you turn to figure 1230, it then shows the uh, physical state change that these sensory nerves undergo. In the middle, we have the relaxed muscle. On the far left, the contracted muscle. And uh, on the far right, the contracted muscle. And the far left, we have the stretched muscle. The plot down here is just looking at the potential changes. And so this just tells us that our afferent nerves are continually monitoring um, the muscle and its status. In the relaxed state, it'll generate action potential to feed back. It also feeds back during the stretch state. And the feedback of these afferent nerves kind of declines in the middle of contraction. So more of a stretching of the, of the muscle that gives sensory feedback to your potential nervous system. Continually monitoring the status of these muscles. Uh, furthermore, you notice in the stretch phase, the action potential increase. Uh, this ties into why you want to stretch before an exercise, like you're in a some type of physical, like running or whatever the sport you do. Uh, traditionally, it was believed that it's important to stretch to just get blood flow to the organ. But honestly, your muscles are going to suck blood when they do just directly to keep to homeostasis. They're going to bring blood to more active organs or decrease blood flow to less active organs. Uh, more recent data supports that you stretch a muscle before exercise so it accommodates to that new stretch release. So normally, uh, these stretch receptors, uh, if you would maybe stretch too much, like say you slip or something like that, your body's going to try to uh, reflex and re put the body back in the upright position. If you stretch before an exercise, the body's now going to reach that new length, and now you can do a more long like stretching, running, or, or whatever during the exercise. So when you're doing the exercise, the body's not going to pull back your skeletal muscles uh, as a short distance or a little bit. Might be stretched out a little more during the running or, or whatever your thing's going to be. So it's believed now to be just getting your nervous system primed for this longer running or a little bit of this maybe. Does it also help blood flow or not at all? Uh, it would activate blood flow. Who asked that? <laughs> yeah, it would. That would increase activity of the muscle, which would then increase the blood flow. So yes, um, but it's now believed that the, the helpful reason to stretch is not directly the blood flow, but just extending the range of that muscle to stretch, so they make so you don't your body won't just naturally recoil or reflex at a shorter stride, for example. So yeah, that that would make it more active and increase blood flow. Um, I want to take the next few minutes to uh, transition to the smooth muscle. We have 15 more minutes. 
I do have a video. I'll probably show it on, um, instead of right now, I'll probably show it on Thursday because I just want to introduce the smooth muscles so we're not getting behind. So that actually concludes our discussion of the skeletal muscles. We'll transition to the smooth muscles today, and then on um, Thursday, we'll talk about the heart muscle in better detail, chapter 13. So I'm going to request that you reread chapter 12 if you've not already done so over the smooth muscle, and then chapter 13. Um, I don't know, I can't recall the, the section numbers, but at least the first few, if, not, if you can't get into the whole chapter, at least read the first couple of uh, sections which look familiar what we covered in the last one until you read it. Is that Tuesday or Thursday? Tuesday. Next Tuesday. So yeah, seven days. So I want to take some time on this image if you've got your guided notes. Uh, label them if you don't, maybe let it draw something analogous to this. I'm going to spend a few minutes here just to get some really good with a ton of information. We're transitioning to our smooth muscle, which is built quite differently than your skeletal muscle and it operates, therefore, quite differently. Skeletal muscle still generates force, but um, it's built very different. Furthermore, in our smooth muscle, there are two subtypes of smooth muscle. The two subtypes include single unit and multi-unit. So highlight or circle the, the label there on the top. We have our single unit and our multi-unit smooth muscle. In this image, the gray things are your smooth muscle cells. And you'll notice in your handout that you're turning in Thursday, people are trying to draw these things like this. So the gray things are representing your smooth muscle cells. <coughs> Furthermore, if we look at the image, we look in the periphery, the edges of the images, we can see some autonomic nerves. Autonomic nerves give us what type of control? Involuntary control, very good. What were the two subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system? We had the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. They are part of the peripheral nervous system, but they're peripheral, lower ether, autonomic nerves. And we said that's sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is your rest and digest. So our smooth muscle is controlled by our autonomic nerves. And you may recall from chapter 11, that our autonomic nerves are unique in that they have these things called varicosities. Do you remember that? The varicosities release what? Neurotransmitters into a wide area instead of just one nerve controlling a single cell, for example. The neurotransmitter depends on the nerve, so if it's a sympathetic nerve or a parasympathetic nerve. So it's not always a so our autonomic nervous system can regulate our, our, excuse me, our smooth muscles. So our smooth muscles are controlled extrinsically by these autonomic nervous systems. What else can extrinsically control our smooth muscles? Smooth muscles be controlled. They can be told, controlled intrinsically. Some can. You are right. And I want to, um, I'm going to put your idea right here on the shelf for just a second. What are some? Let me clarify this. How? What are some other extrinsic controls besides the autonomic nervous system? Hormones. Okay. So our smooth muscles can be controlled. Uh, you don't want to use the word topically because our smooth muscles are an endocrine brain, so you could say hormonally. Our smooth muscles are also controlled hormonally. So nerves can control your smooth muscles. Hormones can control your smooth muscles. What is a third extrinsic regulator of your smooth muscles? Neurally, hormonally, and humorally. Very good. What does that mean? Something in the blood. That's not a neurotransmitter. That's not a hormone. Like, say, calcium. For example. 
But your smooth muscles are still in the old target cell. They can still be controlled extrinsically by the nervous system, more prolonged by the endocrine system, or even factors in the blood can regulate smooth muscles.